So bonjour, it's a pleasure to be here. I just again want to give a shout out to the amazing team here at the Phi Center. Uh, Phoebe and Miriam and their team have been incredible. Uh, Sarah and Beja uh, from our side have uh, really worked wonders. And the best part is we have, we're talking today about a very complicated set of issues and I hope I can uh, make clear why that is, but we've really assembled an amazing group of people. People hitting this from many different angles, unexpected angles I think, and I hope in the aggregate that that really yields uh, some insights and helps us to make a difference. Uh, to begin, uh, I'm a, as, as Sandra just said, I'm a, a historian of, of beginnings. I'm a media historian. I specialize on beginnings, beginnings of photography, of the telephone, telegraph, film, television. And I'm interested both in what's common to those beginnings, but also what's different and what we can learn from that. Um, Sandra and I are teaching a course on virtual reality right now, and it's wonderful to sort of work with something that's emergent, that's still quite, quite new and un unformed, and it fits a lot of earlier patterns. One of the more disturbing patterns that we see again and again, uh, especially with time-based media, is the problem of uh, people being fascinated by what's next and not being so fascinated by what's just behind us. That's the old stuff, let's go on to the new. And the result is stuff like this. I mean, nitrate decay is familiar to anyone who's, who's, been, who's interested in early cinema, but if you're er interested in early television, it's a very similar problem. First, a lot of early TV was live, so there is no record, but then when it was taped, the tapes were recycled. And so programs would be taped over programs, would be taped over programs, with the result that we have very little material left from those amazing early years of television. This is a pattern that keeps repeating itself. Film, television, games, and we're there now with, uh, with our contemporary media forms. Um, <laughs> I'm sure some of you have encountered this uh, over time. One of the really intriguing things to me in, in doing a number of interviews before this conference was that the one question every journalist asked was the question, why bother? Why are you interested in this? Why does it matter? Why should we save the past? So I think Sandra put her finger on one of the reasons. The past is sort of the voice, it's our voice now. It's what we see as important. It's, it's lessons that we have to impart to the world. And for a future generation, those voices should matter. Uh, so, okay, that goes without saying. That's the task of history. We try to learn from the past, we try not to repeat mistakes, of course. But as a historian of beginnings, and we're now in the beginning of this moment of interactive documentaries or locative documentaries, immersive documentaries, for me one of the real reasons is that the beginnings are the period of radical innovation, not simply iteration. So in other words, if you think what, if I look back to the beginnings of cinema and the beginnings of television, what you see is an incredible plurality of possibilities. Early makers don't have rules. They don't have preconceived ideas of what the medium should be, and they try crazy stuff. And within a decade or two, the crazy stuff dies off, and one or two mainstream, usually economically backed models, survive. If we think of what film is, we have a, if, you, if you ask someone what's a movie, they have a very clear idea. But if you were to go back to 1897 or 1898 or 1899 and see what people were actually making, it's a bizarre and wild and rich set of alternative ideas, most of which we've forgotten, and some of which come back later with the advent of new media like television or even today like VR. So one of the really important things about beginnings is their plurality, their pluriformality, their multitude of possibilities that will be erased. They will be overshadowed. You know, it's like an ecosystem. Some things start to grow at the same time and suddenly tr some trees are bigger than others and they overshadow the little ones. The little ones die out and only the big survive. Well, those little ones can actually hold the key to a future. They can hold incredible creative uh, insights and energy and ideas. So I think my focus as a historian of beginnings obviously is on saving that innovative period. But my conviction is if we save the beginning, we'll keep on saving because the next generation will think, hey, my stuff is just as important. So once you've established that pattern, it will take off. So A, there's a good reason to do it for innovation's sake, maintaining that that spirit of plurality, but B, once people start it, it will continue. Uh, and we have, I mean, history is so rich with stuff that we might write off as crazy, but in fact, these are really the, the, the sites of uh, amazing stuff. What to save and for whom? Crucial questions, and um, 
the what to save part is very complicated in the case of uh, interactive documentaries digital culture in general. If you think about, I mean, right now we're above the 400 hours per minute of video uploaded to you, YouTube. That's like 67, hour, uh, 67 years worth of video being uploaded per day. All of us are coming from a world of books and films and DVDs. That's in all of our background in this room and maybe even for the people watching. Um, and that means we're used to, to, to finitude, we're, we're, we're used to limits, we're used to a finite amount of material. There are only so many books, and it behooves us to try to keep them. But this level of productivity is unkeepable. It requires a new way of thinking, and we have to learn to forget. We have to learn to let go. So I'm not standing here saying the inherited notion we have from the advent of the book in the 15th century until now is something we have to stick with. We can't keep everything. We've got to be strategic about what we keep and what we don't keep. We have to be very creative about how to keep. But we can't keep it all, that's for sure. And so that's a problem. That's a, a paradigm shift that we have to reconcile ourselves with. Our inclination will be, and you'll, you'll, you'll hear this today, and I think it's, it's right, the inclination is to save the best, to save the things that we do this with our docu-base at MIT. We save projects that have been... Uh, uh, been in, a, in a competition, that have won awards, that have been noticed in some way or other. And that's crucially important. But as a historian, I can tell you, historians are a perverse lot. They always want what's not there. <laughs> it's great to go back and see the history of Academy Award winners, but almost every film historian I know is actually interested in the other stuff. The stuff that no, no one except Rick Prellinger bothered to keep. Uh, so, and we'll hear from him later today. So it, we have to find a way to keep both what our culture thinks is important, but also those things that could be important for a future, that we don't see the importance of yet. Those hidden gems, those, those hidden insights that otherwise will be forgotten. The other thing that's really peculiar to the interactive documentary form, these new digital life forms, is that in fact they're very... Uh, and I'll use this word a few times, very elaborate ecosystems, these things have research dimensions behind them, processes behind them that are not simply a product. Uh, Kat Sizek's work, and we'll hear about this later today, there's a whole methodology behind the creation of what finally winds up on the computer screen that really needs to be kept. It's part of the process. This is simply, the project itself is simply a moment. Or a project like Hollow, which has been able to build a community after the product was released, that community is part and parcel of this broader ecosystem. So this is not about keeping the book or the movie or the video. We can't just simply extend that analogy to interactive documentary forms. Actually, they're larger ecosystems, and we have to really strategize what to do about that. Um, lots of ways, <laughs> chicken soup, lots of ways to save it. And we can dry it, freeze it, can it, uh, have a recipe to reconstruct it, think about where it's sourced, or even write about its effects in, in poetry. So all to say, we have to be creative and go at this from a plurality of perspectives. The great danger facing these, uh, these um, documentaries is the complexity of their ecosystems. Uh, this is from DocuBase, and it just, it's one of the pages, one of the search functions that allows you to go at it from the, the kind of software that's being used. But any given documentary, interactive documentary, might use a handful of these. And if any one of them goes out, if any one of them has to be up, updated in a significant way, You've, you've, you've broken, you've broken the, the project, essentially. So this is kind of a new condition, this, this complexity, this interdependency. Uh, it's something we, we you know, we, we're familiar with saving other forms that are relatively stable. As unstable as music may seem, it's a, it's a finite uh, kind of amount of information to hold. And we're inclined to extend the analogies that we know from the past, from other media forms, to the present but my conviction is they don't work so well. So today we're going to hear about a number of different strategies that have, been work, that, that have been used and that work. Emulation is often used in the games world. It works. It will probably work for some aspects of some interactive documentaries. Uh, the art world, the digital art world, uh, uses migration uh, very often, and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strategy that works and it will probably work for interactive, some forms of interactive documentaries. But I think what's important for us is to see where it works and where it doesn't work. What, looking at the strategies we're currently using for digital pres preservation, 
What can this help show us about these interactive documentaries that makes them different, that requires new strategies, that requires new techniques? So that's something we're really going to have to pay uh, a lot of attention to. Uh, the question of responsibility is a crucial one. We have large organizations like National Film Board or Arte where we can easily say, you guys are rich, like do a little bit more, but they're not. Their budgets are always being cut and we might think this is a responsibility of a producer. We might think it's a responsibility of its patrimony in the end. A government might care. We might even think of these projects like washing machines where we add a special little extra fee to it for that day when you throw it away and the fee is there to help pay for the recycling. Why aren't we tacking on into our budgets a little fee that will help us prepare this thing when that day comes? Um, of course, an obvious fix, or not a fix, but a strategy as we look ahead is to try and future-proof what we make, to try to think about preservation when we're actually in the act of production. And I hope we get some good ideas on this. The one that comes to my mind is that usually open source and open standard software is more robust and stable, more open, more easy for many people to tweak than proprietary commercial software, which is here today, gone tomorrow. The company's taken over or the company changes its uh, priorities and boom, the software is gone. That doesn't happen so much with open source and uh, uh, open standards. So, okay, that's one way to think about this, but it behooves makers and it produces uh, behooves production or uh, organizations to really think carefully about how to build in stability, how to build a future into the project. Um, access is something we'll talk about today, and this is crucial. We want to make sure that these products are available for future generations. The great promise of uh, interactive documentaries, uh, as opposed to their cinematic and sometimes television counterparts, is that they reach different audiences. They have the capacity to reach audiences, audiences that are native to mobile devices, are more inclined to work with these forms, forms that encourage also kinds of interaction they're familiar with. This stuff reaches other audiences. How can we make sure our past is available to them? How can we make sure that our present is available to that, to that future that's coming down the pike? So um, one of the key things that's, that, that I hope comes out of this conference uh, today, and we'll have a round table tomorrow for the, kind of for the insiders, is to really see if we can shape a policy agenda, if we can put the preservation of these works into the kind of standard um, yeah, policy uh, agenda that other art forms, other cultural forms benefit from. Uh, I, I hope we can do that. And I hope we can think a little bit about where to find the funding for this. Um, so with that, I think I've almost hit my time mark, so I think we'll stop right there. But thank you very much. <laughs>